friends welcome to this meeting here in surrey greater vancouver area i am very happy to come here and meet all of you the purpose of my visit here is to share with you my experiences with a perfect living master azur maharaj baba sawant singh i do not claim to be anybody enlightened myself i have never claimed that i only can share with you some experiences i got with somebody who had good experience himself and he shared his experience and send many of you are on the same travel path that i was in and i still am in which is to our true home such khand such khand is our true home because we don't belong here when we look at our lives here this is a world of ups and downs world of duality pain and pleasure this is not the kind of world our own intuitive self likes to live in our mind also rattles between good and evil something nice happens we love it something bad happens we feel pain and we regret it we get frustrated it's a very uneven kind of life here and this is not appear to be our true home this physical creation that we see around us is made up like that with pain and pleasure we are all human beings we have become human beings because of our own actions good and bad if all our actions were good in our past lives we would not be here we would be in heavens and there are heavens which you can actually verify while you are still in a human body and if all the actions of ours in the past were bad we would be not here either we would be in hell and there are hells which can be actually experienced and touched upon while you are still in a human body so we are here because of a combination of good and bad we did something good and something bad in our previous life which which were good for us because we became human beings why is it good to be a human being because only in human life we can seek our true home in no other life can we seek our true home according to our indian scriptures there are 8.4 million types of species of life forms life form means any form physically made up or non physically made up in which there is a soul a soul gives life soul is life without soul there is no life a mind is not soul mind is a thinking machine mind does not give life soul gives life soul gives life to the body soul gives life to the mind soul gives life to our sensory systems which we call the astral body or sukshma sharir these forms of life that we have they are listed in that literature on ancient literature to be 8.4 million chorasi lakh these 8.4 million include all the plant life in fact 5.4 million in that list are in plant life or life under the sea and therefore you can imagine bulk of the souls are in a very primitive form of life like trees and shrubs and uh, and little herbs and things like that but even out of the remaining life forms only in the last category of 400000 that they have listed human life comes as one of them out of all these 8.4 billion lives none of them have any free will none of them make choices they live according to a destiny and a programming by which they are created by which they die so there is a very big difference between a human life and life of any other form it also includes the list of 400000 also includes angels and who we worship as gods deities they are all included in those life forms none of them have free will either because 
they do not have a developed mind which can discriminate and make choices like plants and insects and snakes and birds and mammals or they are too greatly evolved at astral and causal planes of consciousness and therefore they know about the future. If we came to know about our own future, our free will will disappear. Those people don't have free will because they know what is going to happen. It's already fixed. We also have a fixed destiny, completely fixed, but we don't know it. We have no knowledge of our future. Therefore, when we make choices, we don't realize that the choice we are making by thinking is already been made somewhere, written somewhere. And we think we are making a choice here. And therefore, we have an experience called free will. It's just an experience, but a wonderful experience. Because this wonderful experience of making a choice gives us the freedom to seek. And when you can seek something, you find it. When you desire something, you find it. That is how the law operates here. And since we cannot see that the whole thing is already pre-programmed and we have no idea what the future is like, therefore the experience of free will, of making choices in our head, I will do this or not do this, I will go right or I will go wrong, I will go right or I will go left, all these cho choices we make are real for us. And because they look real, our seeking becomes real. And therefore, we can seek to go out of this mess and to our true home. This is a great blessing of human life alone. Only human life has this great opportunity. So therefore, in human life, the human body has been constructed in a particular way that it is divided into two parts. It's a great, very great creation, a human body. It's the best form of life that has been created in the entire universe. Because in this small body, this very small body, there is a head on top and the rest of the body below. And these eyes in front of us are the dividing line. These eyes, human eyes with which we look outside, they divide the body into two parts. The part below the eyes, which is the pinda or the physical body, of course, the whole body is pinda, but there's a division of what we can do with these parts. This lower part of the body has all the energy centers, what we call the six chakras or the six centers of energy are all below the eyes. They start from the up outside of these eyes and they go down along the spine. You can go and from the bottom, you go through the bottom of your body, the torso, you go to the genitals, you go to navel, you go to heart, you go to the throat, you come back to the eyes. These are six centers of energy. The whole system of our body is operating with different energy circuits in these six centers. Our association outside is also being taken care of by these six centers. Everything that we are experiencing through energy of any kind is being experienced through these six centers. They are very important for our very existence. They are very important for us to interact with this universe and this world. But then there is the upper part of the body. These very physical eyes which are outside have an internal eyes also. They are not connected with these physical eyes, but you can see with those eyes. These ears we have on the side of our head also have inner ears which can hear without these ears. We have inner body which can do all the functions right in the head, right up to this point, which can do all the functions that the outer body can do. Thus creating a possibility of having a second body which is not physical and operates only in the head. And this is a very interesting way to set up like that in the human system, that the human body has these centers of energy below and there are centers of awareness, of higher awakening, higher knowledge to wake up to something other than what we are. Like we go to a sleep and go to dream, in the dream we have a different body, not this body. This body goes to sleep and we take up another body. 
what is common between that dream body and this body is it is still our body the self which is operating in this body also operates in the dream body the self does not change the body changes the world changes the experience changes but the self never changes you will notice that even in the highest forms of experiences highest forms of spiritual awarenesses the self will never change who you think you are not as body but inside the body that the iness that you have that this is myself i am talking i am thinking i am seeing that i is operating from a self and the self will never change whatever changes cannot be called real it is real for the time we can experience it therefore the whole world we are seeing outside changes all the time everything is changing you look out into the sky you look into the galaxies around us they are all changing spinning around changing time is making everything change outside you look inside everything seems to be changing all your imagination is changing then what is not changing is the self that is experiencing all these things the self never changes therefore the only ultimate reality is the self who are we ultimately that is being the experiencer no matter what our form and that is why they say if you can be self realized if you are just one step short of god realization if you can realize who the self is in you who are you really in what is your reality which never changes but and is able to experience things that change and if you can know who you are who the self is you have discovered the ultimate reality because it never changes so that alone can be called the real thing now this physical body of ours with division of two parts the below the eyes being the part of energy and above the eyes the part of awareness the upper part can help us to know who we are it's a great a great gift to us it's a very great gift that in this physical body which is running autonomously our heart is beating autonomously we breathe normally we don't try to breathe we don't do anything trying to do the whole lymphatic system circulation system muscle system nervous system all working automatically we don't control these and if if our whole life was just uncontrolled like that we would be like any animal we would be like a tree like a plant like an insect that's how they live but since in our case we have this awareness ability a head that can make choices can see options and alternatives and say which one should i choose this is not available to any other form of life only to human life because of that we are able to discover our true self while we are in a human body now what is it inside our head that can cause all this just like we have these centers of energy which function for different forms of energy to sustain our body and our experience here there are centers of awareness inside us and there are several centers of awareness i will tell you a little story of my own great master huzur maharaj baba sawan singh one day my uncle who lived in karachi now in pakistan and he was a weather man there he was a meteorologist and he lived on a beach on the clifton beach in karachi beautiful place he had a very beautiful big house so he invited the master great master baba sawan singh to come and have a little vacation in his house so it was a long journey from the dera in punjab to lahore and then traveled by train all the way but we were a small group of people we traveled with the master i was one of them young but it was in the 40s that we went when we reached there we found out that my uncle and his wife my auntie they used to go to a certain swami ji swami brahmanand ji who was a very good swami he used to teach people how to do different kind of sadhanas different kind of meditation but mostly based based upon the six energy centers 
He said, you can open your centers with your concentration of attention. And therefore, he gave certain experiences to his disciples. He was also very good in Ayurvedic medicine. And my uncle and my aunt, they were not going to him for learning meditation because they were following the system that Baba Savan Singh was teaching, which was Surt Shabd Yoga, that we put your attention on the Shabd, on the sound. So they were not interested in learning about how to put the attention on the lower centers. But they would go to Swami Brahmananji in order to get Ayurvedic medicines from him. So when they invited great master to their house, they said there's a good time for Swamiji to get a little blessing from great master. So they went to Swami Brahmananji and said, Swamiji, our guru, our master is coming from Punjab and we would like you to meet him. And Swamiji said, just bring him to me, I will bless him. That was not what they expected. They had to then design some event by which this can be done differently. So they decided to have a lunch in their house and they had a little sofa, loved seat sofa with two places to sit only. So they put it there in the uh, living room and the great master was staying in their house. They invited Swamiji. So Swamiji came and sat on one of those sides of the chair. Then they invited great master to come from the bedroom. He came out. He sat there. We were a pe group of people watching this. I was one of the witnesses standing there to see what happens now. So great master came and my uncle said, Master, this is Swami Brahmananji. We were talking to you about earlier. And great master folded his hand and put his head down. And Swamiji raised his hand on top of great master's hand and said, I bless you. And great master said, thank you. And we said, this is turned everything topsy-turvy. We thought it will be the other way around. This is very strange. But anyway, whatever happened, happened. Then, great master said to Swamiji, Swamiji, isn't it a great pity that so many yogis and swamis are caught up in these six energy centers below the eyes and nobody knows about the twelve higher centers and nobody knows about these eighteen chakras that run our life and the possibility of opening these higher chakras, twelve chakras. Swami Brahmana looked at him, he said, Master, I have never heard of these 18 chakras. Where are these 18 chakras? I only know of 7 or 6. People talk of 7 sometimes, but I have never heard of 18 chakras. The great Master said, Have you not heard of the 6 chakras of Pinda, of the physical body, and the 6 ch chakras of Anda, of your astral self, and 6 chakras of Brahmanda? Haven't you heard of those as such Kanda? Master, I have never heard of these things. Will you please explain them in greater detail? And Master said, you know I have come for a short visit here. If you happen to come to Punjab, to my Dera, I will certainly explain everything to you. So, the Swamiji was left a little bewildered that how come he had never heard about these 18 chakras? He only knew about the six which he had been practicing. Anyway, Swamiji could not sleep that night and he was thinking of these 18 chakras, where can they be? So, great master left and came back to the Dera. After a few days, Swamiji told his disciples, I am winding up this ashram. I have to go and find out where those 18 chakras are. So, he wound up and came to the Dera. And great master, he arranged VIP, treat VIP treatment for Swamiji. He was given the best accommodation in the guest house and he was given the best food that was served there. He was given a few attendants to look after Swamiji's comfort day and night. And Swamiji used to wear saffron colored robes and he wore a, a little kind of a muffler around him which he used to hold with his hands and walk with great dignity like that. I still remember his walk and he came and he was treated like VVIP, he felt very happy. And great master said, Swamiji, you can see me anytime, 24-7, day or night. He felt very happy that he's been given special privilege. 
So he to test it out, one day he went to see great master at 12 o'clock at night, at midnight. And the guards were told, when Swamiji comes, open the doors. So Swamiji came, they woke up the great master. Swamiji has come. They woke all him in. Swamiji came and great master greeted him. Swamiji, what can I do for you? No, just wanted to have your darshan master. He just want to check if he has access to him 24-7. And he went back. He said, I, this is a great place. This is a great master who will give me so much love and affection and he is giving me all this treatment. Then great master ordered that when Swamiji comes to his satsang, to his discourse, he will sit next to him. So there used to be a chanter, a party who would recite from the various spiritual books which the great master used to explain. So Swamiji sat in between that chanter, the party and himself. And Swamiji felt very nice and as great master would discourse, Swamiji sat next to him on the stage, high stage. And after a couple of days, Swamiji said, because master was saying, look at all these yogis and swamis, they are caught up in these six chakras. And Swamiji would look at him like this. After two days, he complained to great master. He said, master, I have a little problem. Yes, Swamiji, what is your problem? My problem is, when you are talking and I want to listen to you, I have to keep my neck bent like this. I've got a pain in my neck. Great Master said, I also saw that. Therefore, you should now sit in front. So from the stage, Swamiji came and sat on a chair in front. After a few days, Swamiji complained against, Master, I have a problem. Now, Swamiji, what is your problem? My problem is that you are sitting so high, so when I listen to you, I have to put my head right up and I've got a pain in my neck. A great master said, I also saw that. No, no, Swamiji's chair should be moved 30 feet behind. So now Swamiji's chair is gone behind 30 feet. After a few days, Swamiji complains again. Master, I have a problem. Now what is your problem, Swamiji? My problem is that when I sit in a chair, people behind me can't have your darshan. I feel very bad about it. Great Master said, I also saw that. Remove his chair. Let him sit with the ordinary people at the back. Ultimately, Swamiji was right at the back. All those special privileges were gone. He was given a little hut to live in, where he set up an Ayurvedic dispensary. And he was like anybody else. I in those days used to practice a little homeopathy. So great master had given me also a small little clinic, which was next to the clinic he set up for him for Ayurveda. So we used to sit where there was no, no, no customer or no patient. We would sit with each other to discuss. One day I was sitting with Swamiji. He says, your master is a great diplomat. Look at the way he treated me when I came. And look at my situation now. I can't even go and see him. I have to wait in line before everybody. He's a great diplomat. Had he treated me like I am now, I would have gone away after one day. But he knew what I needed. And he treated me so nicely. And now he has trapped me with his love and I can't go anywhere. I am trapped by love. The story is so beautiful that he understood that in this human body, in this little head of ours, lies all the secrets of creation and the creator himself sits inside. Of course, all the scriptures of the world say that. All the scriptures say that. That the truth lies inside you, cannot be found outside. In fact, in the Bible it says that this is the body, is the is for the living, is it for the living master, for the living God is sitting inside you. In our holy Granth Sahib, it says, Kaya Nagar, Nagar hai Niko, which is Sauda Hardras ki te. This body is like a city. If you want to have real transactions of Hardras, of the nectar of the God himself, go inside and have a transaction. Get a Sauda from there. This is openly said, Ghar mein ghar dikh lai de, soi sat purk sajan. One who can show the house your true house within this house. Follow him as your Sadhguru. So these are all statements showing that the truth is lying inside. It was not new thing 
even for Swamiji to find out that the secret is all in a little part of our body called the head. And we have everything inside. No matter how we go about it, what we say, the truth remains. That if we go inside our head, we will find everything, including our true self, which never changes, and the part of which the self is made, that is totality of the self, totality of consciousness, which we call the ultimate creator or God, all sitting inside. It is a little strange that the creator is inside and the soul is inside and yet we are living outside here and we don't even know that this is available to us right in the head as human beings. But if we are ready to go home, that's a big statement. If we are ready to go to our true home, we will go home. Can you imagine? If we are ready to go to our true home, if we are seeking to go to our true home, we will find the way to go to our true home. How is that possible? Because after all, this is a created world. At one time, we were in our true home. We were not always here. Otherwise, we would not say it is our true home. We were once in our true home. We have come into this experience for the sake of experience. We have come into different levels of experiences in order to have different levels of experiences and then go back home. We came for seeing something, touching something, having these experiences in physical world, in astral world, in causal world, a world of mind only, world of senses only. We came into these different worlds to have different experiences and then we were supposed to go back home. But we liked the experiences so much that in spite of the pain and pleasure involved, in spite of the duality of, of these experiences, we still got attached to some parts of it and got attached so much and desired so much of these outside things that we've forgotten our true home, even forgotten the purpose of why we came here. We came here just to have an experience. It is like going to an amusement park, going to a carnival to have little fun. Children love that. They go to a carnival. They go on those rides. They go round and round with the horses going up and down. They go on the big Ferris wheels. Those are rides. Supposing we say, I want to make this Ferris wheel my own. I want to make those little horses my own. It's not done. You not come there to possess anything, to own anything. You come there for a ride. We came into this world to have a ride and to have an experience and go back home. We are trying to make those things our own, which will never become our own, whether we like it or not. We try to put so much attention on what kind of house we have, what kind of furniture we have, what kind of type of car we have, what type of jewelry we wear, what type of clothes we wear. And we are constantly trying to make them our own. This is mine. That's yours. This is mine. I am having more of mine. Then one day, death comes in the physical body and everything is left behind. All of us leave it behind. No exception at all. And yet, we still try to make them our own. How can you make these possessions which were merely for an experience while you are in this body? The body was created just to have a little experience and we are trying to make things our own. More than that, we are trying to make people our own. These are my children, these are my friends, these are, I, I love them, I do this, and none of them go with us when we die. We are trying to th think that we will live forever. We see people dying. People die in front of our eyes. People have all been dying who are old. Yet we think we will never die, we can make all these things our own. Uh, people of my age come to me sometimes. I am going to be 90 this year, 9-0. And people come to me and say, we are making a plan in 10 years, we will go get so much reward. I am taking an NOT after 20 years, I will have so much. Half our foot is in the grave and half is outside and we are talking of such plans. How come? We don't see that this is a very temporary life. This body is very temporary. In terms of cosmic time, we talk of billions of light years and so on, we are talking of today in science. And then we think we are going to be here forever. We're making, trying to make things our own. 
main reason why we do not know where our true home is and why we are not going back when we are supposed to go back is our desires and attachments with a temporary experience that's what is happening to us and then what arrangement did we make when we were in our true home and we decided to come for a little visit here for a short time to have an experience different from what is in our true home in our true home there is no duality there is no opposites there is no pain and no pleasure it's bliss it's a state of bliss all the time it's what they called the truth and the nature of consciousness total consciousness with truth and ultimate bliss sat chit anand that's how they describe it that these are the state of bliss that you cannot have here yet we can have pleasure and pain here we can have opposites here we came for a different experience obviously and why did we want a different experience were we not very happy there with sat chit anand you should be happy all the time we were happy what what was the need for us to go into a state of happiness and unhappiness state of pain and pleasure when we were already happy there are souls individuated units of consciousness like ourselves still in our true home they never came we decided to come we decided to come to have a different experience when we go back such is the story told in some of the books when the soul that have been here in this experience of duality when they go back to their true home they sing and dance much more than the souls there the souls there say what is so special about you you are souls like us and you are just the same soul we are state of happiness why are you jumping around so much and dancing better than us and we tell them you don't know what you are missing <laughs> the very principle that is being used here the very principle we use here of understanding that happiness can only be seen and experienced when we have unhappiness that light we are seeing here would not be seen by us if there was no darkness that every experience here, here is being created by its opposite when there is no opposite in our true home we create an artificial experience to create the opposite making it worthwhile to come into this universe and go back and have a greater appreciation a greater bliss than the others by going to our true home people sometimes ask me what is the purpose of this creation that's the purpose of the creation it creates gives us a greater experience of our own true home where we are always there so that is why when we go back the other soul say what is special with you because they have never seen anything opposite to what they have they do not have that level of appreciation which we have that's the purpose of having a different experience but if we were there to start with there is no time or space there but i have to tell a story make it like it like it is like here just for the sake of understanding if there is no problem there and we are coming for a place which has problems like this physical world we all have problems we have pain and pleasure so we don't like pain we don't like suffering we like enjoyment but not suffering suffering comes with enjoyment this world is so created that you have to have suffering with enjoyment the very same things that give us joy and pleasure can become suffering a little baby is born in our house bundle of joy such a lovely little cute little baby the same baby grown up and does not listen to you and say he is a rascal does not listen to any of his parents what is he doing and he gives disappointment to his own parents same little bundle of joy people meet their friends they become lovers and they say we are soul mates made for each other many of them come to me we are soul mates bless us we are getting married very good congratulations i bless you and after 3 months they come back again we are in the divorce court i say what happened you are soul mates we found out from day 1 we were not made for each other say, that is not what you said on day 1 to me this is what is happening the very thing that we think is going to give us a joy the same object the same thing the same person becomes a source of unhappiness 
So this is a strange way that the events of this life are placed in so in such a way that we have to have joy and unhappiness, pleasure and pain at the same time in this world. That is why we are not here to stay permanently in this state. But if we knew that this is the kind of life we have come for, were we not intelligent enough in our true home to foresee this, that this is going to happen and we have better be careful when we go there, not get attached to those things, just enjoy and come back. Did we lose our intelligence at that time? Or have we forgotten what happened? No, we were too intelligent to miss this point. We made arrangement before we ever came here that when we are tired of this experience and we want to go home, we will make an arrangement pre-arranged right from day one of before we ever came here. We made an arrangement how to go back. What was that arrangement? The arrangement was that this world which is merely a creation, a, a, a reflection of our own true self, a programmed self that is using a mind for programming and creates a world around itself should have part of that program that when we are tired of this world, we should be able to go back. And how do we do it? When we are tired and we say we want to go back home now, a human being appears in our life. By coincidence, a human being appears in our life and says, you have, this is not your world, go back home. He says, I can tell you how to go back home. He guides us, makes us recall who we are, makes us remember where we came from and takes us back home. Who is that human being? Ordinary human being. He appears as a friend of ours. He appears somebody who can guide us and he knows about it. It appears when he talks to us, he's talking from our true home and not from here. He appears to know all the levels of creation through which we have come, even when he is ordinary human being like us. And he appears very strangely. He only appears in our life when we are ready to go to our true home. Obviously, we made that arrangement because all this is just created thing. He is also created being. If all this what we are looking outside is illusion, maya, mithya, this just destructible, not going to be permanent, any part of it. And a human being appears there, he has to be also to be just illusion, just unreal, like anything else. Of course he is unreal, like anything else. But when he talks to us from this unreality, when he talks to us, he is telling us about reality. And he is not saying, stay more here, get more attached to this thing. He is saying, detach yourself and go inside your own self. And such a human being who appears to us, obviously, is our own arrangement made by us. And what do we do when we follow what he is saying? He says, don't look outside. Don't even look at me. If you want to find who I am, look inside. Everything is inside, including me. That friend of us tells us. And when we say, let's look inside, following instructions of a man outside, when you look inside, that man is inside and not outside. Why has he appeared outside? Because when we want to look inside on our own, we close our eyes, it is dark. There is no light. When he tells us how to look inside, he makes us look at light and appears in that light. Such a human being who comes into our life when we are ready to go, we call a perfect living master. A param sad sadguru. A sadguru, not a guru. A sadguru, true guru. He is an ordinary person like anybody in his life. He is born, he dies. He lives like anyone. He eats, gets sick, gets medicine, treatments, everything, just like us. But the only difference is his state of awareness. Where is he talking from? Where is he guiding us from? Is he guiding us from some books he has read? Is he guiding us from some teachings he has heard? Is he guiding us from some experience he had at one time and he's trying to remember it? If it is any of those, he's not a perfect living master. 
only if he is guiding us sitting at that very moment in our true home is he a perfect living master why we call him a perfect living master is because our imperfections are all arising from the mind when the mind is not with us there is no imperfection we see totality of experiences which is perfect when we see part of it it's imperfect the mind divides our experience into small parts and therefore it's imperfect a person a human being who can see beyond the mind and who can talk to us from our true home he is seeing the totality of everything including totality of our own self including totality of our own journey where we are standing now and when we made the arrangement to go back home and with that that possible awareness of that person he is able to guide us and therefore we call him a perfect person while living because he is like a human being can talk to us at our level he can also say no if we say we want to do this do you agree he can say no if he is not a living person he won't say no he will say what our mind wants some of us worship people who are not alive and treat them as sadguru they might have been real sadgurus but they are not alive when we try to talk to them our mind answers i am the guru we make our own mind our own guru and the mind takes us back into enjoy all this thing very good this is your heaven make this your heaven the minds the mind has been constructed like that it's designed like that it was meant for that what was the purpose of having a mind soul is life soul is consciousness soul is the ability to be aware of anything that's our soul it's a unit of consciousness a unit of totality of consciousness never separated from totality except in illusion so why does the soul need a mind because the soul lives in a timeless eternal state and to have a different experience attaches itself to just a small machine called the human mind the machine can think machine creates time and space machine makes it everything into time and space machine is being put into operation with the power of the soul the soul makes the machine alive is the power source for a machine called mind mind thinks divides and creates a timeline of space and timeline of time itself and creates a time and space and puts events on them i can explain to you how those events are created even and how they are placed on a timeline is all done at once a timeline is created from now the so many events in the future so many events of the past we never saw them we just came and we saw there's an event we are now placed in the middle of a timeline and we have a big past because we the no time no event can be created without a past to so the law of cause and effect what we call karma law of karma these presence here in a physical world is because of past actions how come we came first time we had no past actions how did we have past actions when we came first time <coughs> to this world <coughs> past actions are created by the mind the mind creates us a present a so called present i'll just explain that we come on a so called presence present and there is a past to create the present and a future in front of us all the events are already placed there they are not going to happen one day they are there then we move on the timeline what we call time travel and we time travel from moment to moment and the events came, came coming coming up and we think that we are stationary time is moving through us no our consciousness is moving through time is it a, just a theoretical model i am presenting to you no you can go and check it out where will you find answer to this question what i am saying is right or not correct only where this timeline is being created which is when you are examining your own mind how it works and where is the mind to examine inside your head you will notice that everything i will tell you here today or any other day is all going to be available to you in your own heads don't have to go anywhere outside to learn anything you will learn everything inside your own self your own head 
the mind is sitting inside our head creating this timeline creating time and space and creating events for us and we think it is life because we add on more things to to the mind we add two more covers to become what we are the first cover we add to our mind which has already been empowered by our soul we add sense perceptions we divide experience into seeing hearing touching tasting smelling as if they are different they were not different earlier when the mind was there all of them were together now we separate them and we create another self upon ourselves we took a soul as our center as our self we put a mind around it to create time and space as an experience for the soul we put a cover of sense perceptions which we call an astral body which we call a sukshma sharir it's not a sharir it's not a body there is no flesh there is no physical presence at all 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 it has got is sense perceptions placed around it in the same form as they operate in this body so that it looks like a body with no weight no flesh no no actual physical substance in it with all the sense perceptions intact it's just a cover upon ourselves and i explain to you how you can see that right now if you want to it's not something that i am telling which is far away somewhere it is right here with us we are using it all the time and then to make it little more entertaining more experience different kind we put around the sense perceptions a physical material self and create a physical material world around ourselves to experience that's how we are sitting here with physical bodies inside this physical body lies the sense perceptions which are the astral body inside the astral body lies our mind which we call the causal body which causes all things to happen everything is happened from there and inside that sits our soul part of the totality empowering all these and making it a life that's how life is here this whole process of creation has taken place from inside out soul is there it creates around itself the mind the mind creates around itself the sense perceptions the sense perceptions create around themselves the physical body and the physical body with this power of mind and senses creates a physical world around itself outside is all from inside out to find the reality you reverse this process from outside take it backward in step by step the same steps that we took to come outside we now take the reverse steps to go inside there is a beautiful thing that the mind is performing right now at all times and that is it can imagine things that's great it can imagine things that are not there that means we have an ability to go beyond our physical experience into an imaginative state you can imagine things it's a power of the mind then it has another power that it can put attention it has got a power called attention and attention can be placed wherever we like that's also great you are not on a general awareness that when you sit here you are aware of everything no you have the power to become aware of something we need a book we need to put our attention on the book if you scattered attention we won't read a book we have to read a book by putting attention so this power of attention is great then there's third gift we have got that is we can concentrate our power of attention so imagine remember these three words because if you are really interested in finding out who you are we will use these three things and i am willing to work with you while i am on this visit with meditation with you on this process of using these three things and show you what lies inside imagination attention the power to concentrate your attention anywhere you like this great gifts to us gifts made available so that we can go to our true home while we are in a physical body these are operable while we are in a physical body and that is why it's so important everything we do here supposing i look at these beautiful yellow flowers you also look at these yellow flowers and think of nothing else but the yellow flowers ultimately everything will become dim yellow flowers will become great if you concentrate more you will see nothing else but the yellow flower such is the power of 
concentration of attention which means that you can become aware of something and more aware by attention you can also become unaware of other things by concentrating on something else this is a great power and we are going to use that power in order to discover what is inside us so that is why these gifts that we have been given are part of the process of our going to true home and we learn just this technique this is just a technique a method to understand what we have and to be able to use it but the technique to use it is simple it's very simple instead of putting attention on things that are outside of you in front of your eyes how about putting attention behind the eyes inside you look simple it is simple difficult because we have never practiced it we have used our attention all the time to see things outside we have put our attention all the time to listening to things outside we put our all our attention to dream of things imagine things outside never inside that's the only reason we have learnt over experience perhaps of several lifetimes how to focus our attention on things outside to have a better view better experience of those things outside we never learnt ever how to withdraw attention inside to our own self withdrawal of attention to your own self is totally different from focusing attention on anything it is such a strong habit that we have of focusing attention on things and saying we are concentrating our attention that even when people try to do meditation taught by so many people they say do meditation at third eye center behind the eyes what is third eye center third eye center is not a particular area to discover third eye center is where you are looking at right now as wakeful people if you close your eyes and say i am not my body where am i who am i where am i just put this question to yourself taking the body not to be yourself you will be at the third eye center people try to search for third eye center they look into their darkness in front close their eyes say there is a third eye center somewhere do you know anything you look trying to look anything is outside of yourself nothing is inside when you try to look with these very eyes by closing your eyes how can closing your eyes give you some vision of insight and we think we are meditating by closing our eyes and looking for something or using our tongue to repeat words how can the repetition of words by your physical body and looking trying to look outside which you can't see because you have closed your eyes take you inside people have tried for 40 50 years my friends got nothing because they were looking outside and talking outside all the time to withdraw attention to your own self is a very different experience it is opposite of focusing attention on anything now somebody says i can i can see myself i close my eyes see little self of mine sitting right in there behind the eyes do you know that little self of yours which you see thinking is behind the eyes is sitting outside your eyes i give a little experience to people for that i said do you know if you don't see your little self you will raise your hands you can touch your eyes you close your eyes you can still touch your eyes you know where the eyes are you feel where the eyes are the body is created like that that you always feel where the different parts are you don't have to see i know where my hand is I don't have to see where my hand is i can feel where it is similarly i know where my eyes are i can close my eyes and touch them all right now go to the next step close your eyes and figure out where that little being of your own self is sitting inside the head and you are you are thinking it's sitting inside the head bring your hand slowly up there slowly up there and touch your eyes you will have crossed the little being before you touch your eyes the little self is outside right here not inside you can't create him inside because you are trying to look with the same eyes these eyes don't look inward they look outward this is one of the one of the big mistakes that has kept people from getting any realization inside and they think they are meditating on their self who is the self the simple answer is the one who is looking at that little one 
Who is trying to look at that little being that you created? That's the self. That's always behind. Never anywhere on the side. You see, whatever you make inside and concentrate, you are behind that. Being at the third eye center is not focusing on anything. It is being there. Just the realization that you are not sitting anywhere except inside your head. How do you do that? You can use imagination again. Imagine that this body of ours is not our self, but our house in which we live. Imagine it's a house that has got several floors, several levels. A house of six levels, which is easy to know because there's different energy levels in the torso act like levels, different levels of energy. And you can call them levels of a floor, of a house. So many floors. You are at the sixth floor. When you are looking in the physical body at this time, you're all on the sixth floor. When you close your eyes, you're on the sixth floor of this house. Now, so you are the sixth floor of the house. And once you imagine this is not you, not your head, it's your sixth floor room where you're living, sixth story room. And you are in the center already. Not you have to make yourself there. He's already there. You're already at the sixth floor behind. And you can from there see your eyes are in front. That's because it's you're there. Your ears are in front, are on either side. Your head is on top of you. Then your chin is in front, below. A strange kind of house, bit like a human body. But you are in the house, on the sixth floor, sitting there. Imagination can take you there. That you are there. Not that you have to imagine anything to see. You are there. Then from there you can see what you like. But you are in the center there already. That's the third eye center. And I must explain to you why it has been called third eye center. It's called the single eye, the third eye center, the nukta, the point, the point of constant, the center of con attention, center of consciousness. So many words have been used for that point because that's where we operate from. At all levels, in every body, in every level of consciousness, we never change. The location never changes. The experience changes around it. Now, why is it called third eye center when we are in the physical body? Because these are two eyes. The two eyes don't see the same picture, even in the physical universe. They see two pictures because they're two eyes. They're not in a single location. You go on to 3D movies, and they give you glasses to, wear, to see the three-dimensional movie. The, on the screen, there are two, two messages being sent. The camera that takes 3D movie has two lenses. It records, and the two lenses are separated as much as the two eyes. And it takes two pictures. And then they merge the pictures through those glasses, and we feel things are coming out from the screen and become three-dimensional. Do you know we are doing the same thing now? They're two eyes, they're seeing two different pictures. We don't see them too. We merge them, create a distance, and everything near or far. We're doing the same thing right now with our physical eyes. Then where exactly are we merging them? Where are we seeing it from? It won't take long if you say, if I were to see from the eye, it would be two pictures, so two eyes. But I'm seeing one. Where do I merge it? Back in my head. You merge it at the third eye center. Even now. Third eye center is not such a mystical thing like we make it. You are operating from it now also. You are looking out at the world from there. You are not looking from the two eyes. Two eyes are merely ca carrying on images. And, and those images are not being seen. They are inverted images on the retina. Extension of the optic nerve. They are carrying it to the brain. The brain is getting a vibration where consciousness picks it up and you see. What role has the eyes to play with your saying, I am seeing with my two eyes. The, what you are, where you are seeing it from is the third eye center. If you are there, imagine you are there, not the body, not you. Don't have to find a place to be there. You are already there. You have to imagine the body is around you like a house. You don't have to imagine yourself. People try to imagine themselves to find a third eye center. They make big mistake. If you are there and you imagine you are there, and then, what do you do? Concentrate your attention there. 
this is concentration of attention on where you are when that happens just like i said if you look at the flowers and you will not see other things the awareness shrinks to where you are putting your concentrated attention when you concentrate your attention there you won't know where your hands and feet have gone you won't know afterwards where your legs have gone where your arms have gone ultimately where your body has gone and that's reality has come up simple process a simple process of concentrating our attention on where we really are and not in the body when that happens you find that you can still see you can still hear you can still touch taste smell all these things are still available to you so that is why you discover that the self which you are looking for at the very first level has all the sense perceptions and they are much better than you have in the physical body outside your eyes become so sharp no glasses are needed you can read better than 2020 with those eyes anything you want to read there you are strong your sense perceptions are very clear and stronger than they are here then where are, who where is that coming from that's your more real self than this physical body yet it's not your ultimate soul many people think that is the soul they say when we die our soul goes somewhere to another body or something no soul doesn't go astral body goes that's called the astral body which is sensory body if you concentrate your attention within the sensory body in the head same place where the self is you will become unaware of the sensory body also and you are still there no body no eyes no seeing you go back in reverse to a state where your mind was alone before the timeline was created you can experience it <clears throat> you will know exactly how you created this universe you will find the very process through which the law of karma operates you will find the very process how events are created you will find out how you created the events that caused your life to be what it is that you picked up your destiny from there it was made up there you will also find that what you thought was your mind is only a part of a universal mind and participating in that all the time it was never separated all these realizations come to you by being at that state many of the greatest and, and, and greatest mystics have told that as the ultimate true home because they say when you have come to a universal mind from where all creation is taking place that totality is totality of all creation how can you go any further so many of them have stopped there saying that is our such can't the experience of not having a body not having sense perceptions and having perception as a whole has been called out true home very few people have even thought of anything beyond that but that is not a soul the soul is empowering that state of being and soul is consciousness not that which creates events is the creator of those creator of events and to go beyond the soul is not possible by effort no amount of effort can ever take us beyond the mind because we make all effort with the mind how can you use the same instrument that makes effort to go beyond it therefore the mind can never go beyond the universal mind state it can with proper guidance go up to that point of discovering its own reality but cannot go and discover the soul that is why they say effort has a very limited value in true spiritual experience effort has value in getting these spiritual experiences of being not in this body another body not in any body at all not in the universal mind that can happen and efforts can get you that with proper guidance but to go beyond the mind into true spiritual regions where your soul exists soul per se nothing else is not possible with the effort or the mind now people have tried effortless meditation also one of my friends wrote to me i have discovered that there is no place for effort in our ultimate spiritual thing what we need is effortless meditation so at the end of the letter he wrote to me now i am going to try very hard for effortless meditation 
This is how our mind works. We can't get out of it. We can't get out of a belief in the mind that without effort, without something to do, you can't, you can't get anything in the world. Not even your own salvation, your own enlightenment, you can't get without effort. It's, we have convinced ourselves of that. Therefore, to unconvince is very difficult. So that is why all people who are making effort end up there, at the most. And nobody goes to true spiritual regions. And that's a tragic flaw in the system that we think we, have, we can make effort, we have a free will, we can do all these things, and we try and we try very hard and we try the hardest and we don't get it to our spiritual region. Because effort can't go there. Then something has to be done. How can we then really say there is a spiritual experience available to us? How can we go to our true home? Now here comes the real answer to that big question. You cannot by effort push yourself anywhere, but you can be pulled. There is no problem in being pulled. That you do nothing, somebody pulls you, then you are making no effort. Something else is making the effort. Now what can pull our consciousness, our soul? The only power that exists in this whole universe, created universe and non-created universe that pulls us is the power of unconditional love. When that experience happens to us, whether it happens here or in the astral plane or causal plane, it's that, it's that experience of being pulled by perfect, perfect, pure love that has nothing to do with physical experiences. When that love pulls, we are dragged and taken away. To go beyond the mind, the only way that I know of that can take you there is a pull of love from beyond the mind. Not pull of love here. If you get pulled by love here, you'll be here. If you get pulled by love to the astral plane, you'll be there. If you get pulled by love to the causal plane, you are there. But if you are pulled by love by somebody sitting here in our midst, operating from beyond the mind, that pull can take us beyond the mind. But somebody says to us that your role on the spiritual path is do nothing. Our mind doesn't accept it. How can our role be do nothing? Our role has to be do something. Therefore, even a perfect living master operating from our true home while he's in a human body here and who with his absolute, unconditional, pure love pulls us and draws us and we know there's a pull going on, we still say, what am I supposed to do? I am supposed to do something to get that pull. The mind continuously argues. Therefore, even a perfect living master, if he's sitting here in our midst and says, do this, we like it. Do meditation. More meditation. Ask me, there must be something in it. Do it in a certain way. How many hours did you do? More hours. Oh, this is going to give us results. Do you know that those who are on the spiritual path, the more they meditate, the less experience they get? Because they are not out for experience, they are wanting their true home. And what they want is to be pulled by love. Now here is the difference between us, ordinary people, and a perfect living master in a human body, that when he comes, he has that effect upon us as if it is a soul being pulled by a soul and not that it is something connected with the physical self. We can't explain it to ourselves. So we try to find what is going on. The mind says, watch out. It may be some mesmerism going on, maybe some mind control going on. Watch out. Take care. As yet the pool goes on. Then the mind comes up with a lot of doubts. No, 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 this can't be happening, really happening. I think I'm not going to go, I'm going to go into other, another way. What is happening is not consistent with my belief system. It's not consistent with my religion. It's not consistent with what I have always believed in. I must take care precaution. Maybe the devil has come to take me. Maybe some negative forces are come. The mind think, thinks of all these things. For good reason. And yet the pool goes on. 
A man says, I am never going to go to a perfect living master to see him. Next day is there. And he says, why are you come again? I don't know. Something makes me come here. This is the start. This is the start of the game. The game of love goes on. And that is the real way by which the masters come and pull us with their unconditional love. They are human beings like us. But the distinction is in the love that they show us even as human beings. Their love is totally unconditional. They will love you if you love them. They will love you if you ignore them. They will love you if you hate them. They will love you if you kill them. That kind of love is not common. Yet it is absolutely an ordinary condition for a human being who is a perfect living master. He lives in that state always. And this, people test it out. And this is where it comes out true. Why is that that his love is so unconditional? Because there is no judgment involved. There is no expectation involved. Such a person has not come to take, he has come to give. That such a person has not come to do any other thing except to take your soul home, to your true home, because your time has come, you are ready, you are waiting to go. Period. There is nothing else to be done. Actually, you could be, if your mind was not interfering, if you said, I am seeking my true home, I am waiting for the thing to happen by which I arrange to go home, which is appearance of a person. Not finding a person, appearance of that person. They say, when a disciple is ready, when Chela is ready, Guru appears. When a disciple is ready, the master appears. They don't say when a disciple is ready, he finds a master. You cannot find a master. Because the master is too ordinary. If somebody is not ordinary, he says, I am a master. He is operating from his mind. His ego is being on display. Perfect living masters never claim they are masters. They call themselves servants of masters. They call themselves servants of people. Servants of those whom they have come to take. It's totally different. But when somebody claims something with his ego, he cannot be a perfect living master. And that is why the big distinction. Therefore, you can't fight them. They are ordinary people. How do you know them is their presence comes and affects you. And how does a presence come? Simple process we call coincidence. By chance. By accident. We were looking for something else and they appeared. It's a, just a strange way of using events of life. Circumstances of life produce them. In our life at the right time when we are ready to go home. Now supposing at that time you are able to recognize a perfect living master. And he says... Yes, I accept you. We are ready to go home. Do you know what you need to do after that? Nothing. Mind doesn't believe that, but otherwise that's the truth. In Sri Guru Granth Sahib, such a beautiful book from where I have learned most of my lessons, I must tell you. It says, Nanak Satgur Bheti hai, Puran Hove Jukti. Your effort is complete the moment you have surrendered and found the master. And after that, hasdya, gharandya, parandya, vichye, hove, mukti. You can live your life normally and you will go home, true home. That's the truth. Mind doesn't believe it. Mind says, what will I do? What am I? What, am I? what is my role? Okay, then you meditate. Then you follow dietary restrictions. Then you follow this restriction. Oh, this makes sense. Now I'm going, I'm going on a particular definite pattern. These are our, it's for our mind. Do you know all meditation that we do is only for our mind? All other things, observations that we make on our spiritual growth are mental. Spiritual things are all in our soul. A soul is being pulled by the soul. Oh, a soul that is in our true home is pulling a soul that's still caught up here. Time is right. It says come back. This is such a simple thing. We have made it so difficult by, first of all, not knowing that there is anything else beyond this reality. This is our only reality. The rest is all imagination. What I am telling about astral plane, causal plane, such can't, could be all imaginary made up by somebody. 
मे बी आई एम मेकिंग इट अप राइट नाउ टू टेल अ स्टोरी लाइक दैट वी दिस इज रियल वी आर रियल पीपल सिटिंग ऑन रियल प्लेस इन रियल हॉल एंड and i am also equally real because if i am unreal you won't hear me and if you are unreal well, who am i talking to <laughs> so obviously we are all real here and we all believe we are real me included so when we believe that we are all real this is our only reality now you will discover if you find other realities that at one time we have only one reality at all time we have only one reality when we sleep and go and sleep and go into a dream state in the sleep state and in the dream that's real because we are not aware of where we are sleeping we are not even aware of this body we have a dream body and dream body is running around and things are moving so fast in a dream one moment we are in vancouver next moment calgary looks normal nobody ever questions how could i come so quickly to calgary here if it happened you would all question there you don't question rules of what we call law of nature totally change and they look normal to us because it's a different reality every reality has different rules and different laws operating that reality and the dream reality is different and we say sometimes we say a little awakening comes to us when we are dreaming this is a dream i think it's a dream i believe it's a dream now who is saying that not the body that is sleeping the dream body is saying then what does it do it calls all the people around look it's a dream we are dreaming we are not in a real awakened state and then you wake up there were no other people and that was not your body so we see that we take a reality even when you speak of a higher reality you are still taking that current reality to be the only reality and this is a very beautiful system actually if you look from the top it's the most beautiful way to create experience not experience of shadows on a wall experience of reality that we have used the great immense power of consciousness to be conscious of anything to use the power of consciousness to create through illusion a reality is that wonderful not one reality several just shut off the other realities and make each one completely real and that's how it is happening here we have this reality only if this were not the only reality even if we had access to another reality we don't need a perfect living master here we are looking for a perfect living master here only because this is our only reality we want a physical being like ourselves real of course later on you find the master was as unreal as we were you can find a master in a dream say master found you in a dream and you think it's real you wake up neither you nor the master were real but the master in the dream told you that when you wake up do this when you wake up say there was a great dream i got a prophetic dream he told me what is going to happen 7 days later it does happen here is something that happened at one level of reality that gave an inkling of what would happen at a separate wakeful level of reality such is the role masters perform here as as you go through different realities you find that what they said in one level of reality is true at all other levels of reality because they did not operate only as an image in that reality but were aware at that time of all realities this is a look at the perspective from which such a person would look at that you are aware of the entire creation of all levels and that you know also who you are consciousness totality one single from which everything is happening inside that nothing outside Verizon. all this creation is all within one consciousness nothing is outside and we think it's outside because outside has been created at many levels you are at the same state as a perfect living master looking at these things from that point of view what would you see that the whole thing is a play a created play for consciousness to move in big game big drama at so many levels so many stages the drama is going on It's very interesting experience. Now imagine 
when a perfect living master comes here and he takes us to our true home what does he do really he takes you to the same place which he has you see the whole drama from there what happens to the principle that at one time you have only one reality it dissolves in your true home because true home contains everything there's nothing outside of it therefore all levels become real all levels become unreal from that vantage point a perfect living master does not come to make us better human beings a perfect master does not come to give you something in addition to what you have he comes here to make you identical to himself to give you exactly the same experience he has nothing less they talk of in mythology there's a stone philosopher stone if steel or iron the touched by the philosopher stone becomes gold they describe perfect living master not like that philosopher stone philosopher stone touches iron it becomes like the philosopher stone not gold these perfect living masters when they say we accept you in the physical form they have guaranteed you to be exactly like themselves at the same vantage point of totality of consciousness they never short change you on that it's a very different experience to have when does it come when we are ready when are we ready the seeking becomes so strong in us and we say we are fed up of this we had enough of it if somebody says i have not had enough of it he is not ready once a friend of mine came to me he said i hear your talks they are on a system of youtube or something i hear your talks and i wonder why you are calling on people to follow this path when we are all happy he said, look at me i have a very nice house i got a lot of money i got a nice family i got everything is well wonderful i got a nice job i enjoy it why should i follow you follow any of your teachings i said don't you don't need them go and have a good time enjoy so he went away next week he came again complaining i am so much troubled by my wife we are on a divorce process and i um, borrowed something and i can't give it back my stock prices have gone down all my wealth is so that was not the condition last week what happened superficially he was seeing those things which were good inwardly the very things were causing him problem there was a poor man and he was very happy in his poverty when he became very rich he was very unhappy he didn't know what to do with the riches always afraid one day they'll be stolen no no i should buy stock one day the company will fail all the time worried whole life became mess by getting something which he thought will give me give him eternal happiness i have had a chance to meet multi millionaires i never met more unhappy people than those and yet they thought money will give us happiness we all think when we don't have we think we that will give us happiness when we have it so wish we didn't have all these problems connected with the same thing which we thought will give happiness so this is a strange state where we don't realize that very thing that we are trying to feel will give happiness don't give us happiness true happiness comes when you have totality of experience in a totality of consciousness and after having an experience like this one that is why i say we are very blessed and lucky all of us sitting here are very lucky first of all to be human beings with the ability to have that experience secondly because we are co travelers on the same path we all want to go to a true home otherwise we wouldn't be here and thirdly because since we are ready we are going to find a perfect living master automatically take us home what else could we desire this is the most beautiful moment of our lives when we can have this thing i'll take a break from you now and make a lunch break enjoy your lunch then see you after that at about 3 o'clock thank you <laughs>